Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jack Shelley, and on behalf of the University Lectures Committee, I'd like to welcome you to the second in this week's series of talks dealing with the People's Republic of China, or what we almost always used to refer to in this country as Communist China or Red China, now much more commonly heard as the People's Republic of China. Our speaker, believe me, is able to bring us recent information about the People's Republic of China. It was not previously announced uh, in any of the advance information about him that had reached us here in Ames so far as I know, and it certainly was not available to me. I learned in having dinner with him a moment ago that he is only 14 days away from another trip to no, Communist China. Excuse me, just back. Just back, you bet. He has spent six weeks in Communist China, and so we are really in for the privilege of hearing something very much up to date in the experience of an American correspondent who has spent that much time in Communist China uh, so very, very recently. Our speaker was, by the way, the first Western correspondent to get an exclusive interview with Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai back in the middle 50s. He was one of 18 American newsmen who were invited to visit China in 1956. He was the first American television correspondent to visit Cambodia as the guest of Prince Sihanouk, who of course in recent years has been a guest of Peking himself. Sam Jaffe, our speaker, served in Russia for four years as a Moscow correspondent for the ABC network. He scored a world news beat on the ouster of Soviet Premier Khrushchev by means of a rather cryptic telephone call he made from Moscow to New York and which was properly interpreted at the New York end, and so the news beat resulted. He told me again something I hadn't known just a few minutes ago as we were coming in the door. He mentioned that he was down at the Garst Farm near Coon Rapids in that famous incident, which any of us who were newsmen at that time will never forget, the incident of the visit of Premier Khrushchev to Iowa and that uh, particularly interesting incident on the Garst Farm when uh, silage uh, was thrown at various reporters and uh, uh, a New York Times man, the dignified Harrison Salisbury, was kicked in the seat of the pants and uh, other highly interesting developments occurred during that Khrushchev visit to the Garst Farm in central Iowa. In addition to uh, his Moscow service and his observation of Khrushchev, for three years Sam Jaffe was ABC's China watcher. Uh, he was stationed in Hong Kong, you know, listening and watching for those little bits of information that came across what we used to call the bamboo curtain. He's got a long list of news coverage achievements. They range from an exclusive interview with the Viet Cong to coverage of moonshots. He says, quite modestly, only one moonshot that he covered. Election campaigns by George Wallace of Alabama. He is a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley. He's attended Columbia University and the New School for Social Research. He has won a wide and impressive variety of awards for news reporting overseas. More lately, he's been a special correspondent for the broadcast service of United Press International and for the Chicago Daily News. So it's now my pleasure to introduce someone who recently has come from China and who is very fresh on the subject, speaking on the topic of China and America. Where do we go from here? A man who, as you can see, has been watching international developments and particularly Far Eastern developments perceptively for a long, long time. Here is Sam Jaffe. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Jack, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that uh, story about uh, the uh, Khrushchev trip to the Gars farm and uh, the fact that we were hit with uh, silage and uh, were cussed out, uh, it's still going on by some people back in Washington and elsewhere. But uh, I think basically, uh, I think I can speak for majority of my colleagues, uh, we're out to try and bring you the truth, to try to bring you facts and reality as they are. Uh, I think that we, uh, in my mind, must know more of what's going on. This is a very small world. We live uh, in the jet age and we live in the nuclear age. And uh, this could be catastrophic. So possibly my talk is on China, and it is on China and America, but it's also on understanding. I don't think we have to accept everything other people do. We certainly don't, but we have to try and understand and China is an absolutely fascinating subject. 
I was there two years ago, and I spent two and a half months. I traveled at that time 10,000 miles. On this recent trip that I just returned from, I traveled 15,000 miles to different parts of the country. I found, I'll start off by saying this, in just two short years, a tremendous improvement. I found Chinese people, and this time I spent more time in the countryside with the farmers, the peasants, as they're called, more relaxed, more industrious than I did two years ago. Uh, the same applies to people in the cities of Peking and Shanghai that I visited this time as well as last time, and Canton. Uh, I found more industriousness. You know, they call this the slack season in China. And by slack season, and you are more familiar with that, I'm a city boy than, than I am because I was not raised on a farm, but it means the, the season when farmers normally uh, don't have too much to do. Uh, in China, they have some crops of winter wheat, but their busy season, of course, comes in the spring for spring planting, and then again in uh, uh, the fall for their, their harvest. Uh, but they call this the slack season, and yet everywhere I went, I saw hundreds of thousands of people, young and old, men and women, and children, and young people, working in the fields, and what they are doing, when I say working in the fields, because they have 800 million mouths to feed, and that's a lot of mouths to feed. They are transforming, literally transforming the land. They are literally moving hills and mountains, places where no vegetation grew before, vegetation will be growing within a year. What they are doing is where you have hills of rock or mountains of rock. They are by hand because they are far from an industrialized country and they do have to keep 800 million people busy. They are breaking this rock away and carrying it, carting it away by hand and by animal too. Uh, and dumping it in places where there is dirt. Then they take the excess dirt and they put it back where the rock was. Where the rock has been transported, they cover over with dirt and they grow on top of this. They plant on top of this. And this is going on all over China. It's something new. It's something that uh, just started within uh, the two years that I was there last. These people are working, not because there's anybody standing behind them with a gun pointed at their head, because they are proud of China's accomplishments in really just a few years. That's 25 years since the, uh, the uh, revolution of Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai succeeded. And uh, I was very impressed with what I saw. I was very impressed in the big cities, seeing more consumer goods in the shops. Now, we can't judge when we talk about consumer goods. We cannot think in Western terms or in American terms. Uh, transistor radios, <clears throat> bicycles, wristwatches, uh, incidentally more, <clears throat> excuse me, colorful clothing, and skirts are now available. Skirts were rather taboo, but they are now available again. People seem to have more pocket money to spend. Young people seem to be more relaxed in the sense that the big thing now is to uh, buy art supplies and do painting at home or sculpting at home. And the several art stores that I went to, they were, they were loaded with people, uh, especially young people buying these supplies. So again, when we talk about money, not as much as we have, but more than these people have ever had in their lives, let alone the, the great history of China. Uh, hospitals every place, good modern hospitals. Uh, there is free medical care for all uh, today in China. Disease, major uh, uh, diseases that they had before the revolution, such as venereal disease, has been eradicated. Education, free for all, where before the revolution, only the, basically the sons and, as, as far as higher education is concerned, sons and daughters of the, the, the well-to-do, uh, the, the wealthy, could uh, afford to go to university. Uh, the peasant did not have that opportunity. Today, the peasant's son can go to university. Uh, and certainly, it is mandatory that all children have uh, uh, a middle school, edu grammar school, and a middle school education. Uh, uh, just, you, you can observe wherever you go, on the streets, uh, in the villages, people laughing, people relaxed, people happy, 
people joking. The Chinese have a great sense of humor. Um, as far as Sino-American relations are concerned, the Chinese are reasonably pleased, but there are problems that exist. They do not feel that the United States has lived up, as they put it, to the spirit of the Shanghai communique. I had uh, a two and a half hour interview, this was just shortly before the People's Congress, with one of the top officials of the Chinese Foreign Ministry. And uh, he expressed himself in this way, they are not pleased. They were very upset, based on the spirit of the Shanghai communique that President Nixon signed a little more than two years ago. In, uh, sorry, he did not sign it, it was, uh, it was in writing, but it was, there were no signatures by either side, that there would be a steady improvement of relations. And just last year, they were very upset when the United States permitted the nationalist Chinese to open several new consulates on American territory. They could not understand this. And they said to me, and they said to Senator Mansfield, who was there at the time I was there, is this in effect in the spirit of the Shanghai communique. They were not pleased with uh, uh, the new American ambassador to uh, Taiwan, Leonard Unger's statement after he arrived, that uh, we will always, the United States will always support uh, the government of the Chiang Kai-shek government, the government uh, of the nationalists. And uh, there has been, unfortunately, in 1974, very little progress in our relations. There have been some uh, delegations go, an exchange of delegations. There, as you know, in Washington now, uh, there is the great uh, Chinese uh, uh, archaeological exhibition, the finds, the archaeological finds. But uh, it doesn't look too good for 75. I think uh, a lot is going to be based on, in the first place, if, and I, it's, this is my if, if President Ford goes to China this year, and what, what, if he does go, what he's going to take with him. Uh, they're not talking about too many exchanges this year because, again, of our attitude. I asked whether American news bureaus would be permitted to, uh, to be established in China, in Peking. And there are foreign news bureaus there. The English and the French and the Japanese uh, have uh, correspondents stationed in Peking. And they said no. Uh, they said, uh, if we uh, permitted you to come, for example, and other journalists, American journalists, then they said that would mean, wouldn't it, that our newsmen, our journalists, would have to uh, be stationed in Washington. And I said, of course. And uh, this gentleman said, not as long as there are nationalist correspondents in Washington. So we got into a bit of an argument, and I said to him, I said, but, I said, there are nationalist journalists, Chinese journalists, in uh, Japan, uh, there are nationalist journalists, uh, and, you, and uh, you recognize the Japanese formally. There are nationalist journalists uh, in uh, London and in Ottawa, Canada. I said, what's the difference? I, knowing what his answer would be, he said, the difference is that they never supported the way the United States supported the, they call it, the Chiang Kai-shek clique. Um, they want us to, in effect, withdraw our recognition of our formal diplomatic recognition of Taiwan. We can still have trade relations with them. The Japanese do. The Japanese have a, do a big business with, the, with Taiwan, with the nationalists. Uh, but uh, they want us to formally recognize them and to say very clearly, as the Japanese, as most countries today have done, we're the only ones that are lagging behind on this. Most of our allies have recognized the People's Republic of China. They want us to say that Taiwan is an integral part of the Chinese mainland. Now this is something that both uh, Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong uh, have in common, uh, that Taiwan is a part of China. This is the only thing they agree on. What they disagree on is who is the rightful ruler of now 800 million people. Well. I think we have to face reality. Uh, most of the countries in the world are facing that reality. We have to think about China's past. We have to think that 25 years ago, it was a revolution in China, but the people of that country backed Mao Zedong, or that revolution would not have succeeded. And that 
revolution is still succeeding. They've been there for 25 years, and if anyone thinks that uh, they're going to be overthrown tomorrow, believe me, uh, you're, 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 you're having pipe dreams because that government is, uh, in Peking is there to stay. There's no question in my mind. There's no question in the minds of, of men who have studied China a lot longer, and uh, I'm talking about Americans and others and who have been to China. We have so many, many misconceptions about China. This is something I think that has to be corrected. We've always, I think the American people and the Chinese people have always gotten along. But some of these misconceptions, some of these prejudices in my mind, uh, where Chinese in the past, in our motion pictures and books and such, have been depicted as uh, uh, certainly the men with long fingernails, the Fu Manchu types, uh, the types that, uh, that uh, take white women uh, and rape them, uh, they're evil, they're inscrutable. This is, uh, this is another misconception. They're inscrutable. They're very bright. They're, believe me, they're extremely intelligent, but they're not inscrutable. Uh, I think this is, in many cases, the general view of, of Asians, not just Chinese, by Americans. Or they were laundrymen. That's what they did. They, uh, they uh, came here and opened up laundries. Or they were good working on the railroads, you see. And they all have pigtails. Uh, all of these are, are absolute fallacies. Believe me, absolute fallacies. They are an intelligent and ind industrious people. And based on what I saw in two trips, they are basically a happy people. Now, we also, I still think, and even my colleagues, I think this is another fallacy. I'm talking about my colleagues in journalism, those in Hong Kong who are spoon-fed propaganda stories, I say, from the some of these stories come from the nationalists, some come from intelligence organizations, that uh, when, if and when, uh, Chairman Mao goes, whether he dies or he might be overthrown, there have been reports just recently about this because Mao was not at the National People's Congress. And uh, I'll tell you why he was not at the National People's Congress, at his own request. But um, that then China's going to change. It would revert back to Chiang Kai-shek. Absolute nonsense, absolute rot. Uh, we think the same thing of the Soviet Union. Every time Brezhnev or Kosygin or the late Nikita Khrushchev disappeared, well, uh, there would be uh, uh, another regime, and it would probably be a better regime. Uh, or that uh, communist, the, the, re the communist regime would be overthrown. Another fallacy. Not true. Uh, I think we're, again, pipe dreaming. Because these countries, whether we like their system of government or not, are realities. They don't understand us, really. I don't think they understand democracy, what we call democracy, and what we call freedom. Certainly the Vietnamese have never understood it, and the Chinese don't either. Our system of government, and I think we better realize this before it's too late and get ourselves embroiled again on the Asian continent, our system of government simply will not work in these countries, and their system of government would not work in this country. So if we let well enough alone, if we try to exchange ideas, because this is so important, we can learn a lot from the Chinese. They certainly can learn a lot from us, and they admit this. They want our technology. Not they don't want to go in the way the Russians have gone in, buying Pepsi-Cola plants. They're, everything is planned and calculated there. They need industry, but they're going to do it step by step. It's going to be very gradual. You know, a lot of our, our businessmen, I think, were very disappointed when we started uh, a semi-detente with Peking, and remember, Peking wants this detente too. And if, say, Mao was overthrown, you might get a tougher person in there. There are Chinese, like there are Americans, like there are Russians, who don't believe in detente. And I say, thank God, these men, Zhou Enlai and Brezhnev, the way he's proving to be, are basically moderates. So I think we're lucky to have governments like this around who are opening up, and China is opening up. Because when we don't understand, when we don't have any contact, when we don't have any knowledge, this is when it becomes dangerous. And I can't emphasize too strongly that we do live in a nuclear age. And there is always the possibility of a risk of a hydrogen war. So I think we must understand. Um, Mao Zedong did not appear at the People's Congress at his own request. 
Before the Congress came about, it's been several years in the planning, they had problems, they admit to you, again, unlike the Russians, everything in Russia is perfect, everything is a Potemkin village, uh, like a movie set, a beautiful movie set, but there's nothing behind it. This is not true in China. They admit their shortcomings, they admit they have problems, and they want you to criticize them. I've never heard a Russian in four years that I was in Moscow ask for any criticism. Everything was perfect. Uh, Mao is trying to affect an orderly transition, a transformation of government when the day comes that he uh, expires or retires. If you recall, right after the Cultural Revolution, and it was, that was one of their great mistakes, the Cultural Revolution came about because they wanted to inculcate in the Chinese young people a spirit of revolution, a spirit of what the elders had fought for. Well, they let it get out of hand. They, let, they turned open the schools and then closed the schools and let the young people run amok. And there was terrible violence. And how many thousands were killed, I don't think anyone knows. They admit this. The young people went berserk. But then they brought it under control. They told me that they have learned their lesson. But they still want to keep the revolutionary fervor in the minds of the young people. This, for example, is why the young people, after graduation from middle school or high school, must go out, before they go to university, must go out and work on the farms, not a bad idea, with their hands, with the peasants, alongside of the peasants, China's backbone, and why they must go into the factories and learn a trade. It's also to give the factory worker, and especially the peasant, a feeling that he belongs, a, a feeling that they never had years before, and to inculcate in the young people what these people do, not to look down their noses at someone who's doing menial labor. Uh, the government of China does not consider uh, farming menial labor, nor does it consider uh, factory workers menial. But some of the young people who, you know, don't know what their, what their grandfathers uh, uh, fought for and what they went through now feel, well, the, like many young people in this country, like the world owes them a living. That's why these things came about. But after the Cultural Revolution, at that period, everyone, and shortly thereafter, everyone in China wore a Mao badge, a badge with Mao Zedong's image on it. Gradually, that start, they, you, you didn't see Mao badges. And there has been a de-emphasis on Mao Zedong. This is deliberate. This is Mao's wish. Because he wants the government to get ready for the day, as I say, that he goes, and the day that Zhou Enlai goes. And what they're in the process of doing now is to try and get, they call it the uh, uh, three-in-one combination on all levels to work together, in other words, uh, collective leadership, the old, the middle-aged, and the young. Now, when I say young, I don't mean 17, 18, 20. I mean they consider young uh, to be men and women in their, uh, in their uh, late 30s, early 40s. In government, on all levels of government. So this is deliberately, Mao is being deliberately downplayed at his own request. He asked, he said to the, the uh, Congress, that he did not want to be a delegate. He's back, I believe, in his home province of Hunan. I was told, though, that he approved of every word in the platform and the new constitution, which is a moderate constitution, that was presented just a couple of weeks ago at the National People's Congress. And that constitution I am very pleased with, and I am pleased with the other words that were spoken, Zhou Enlai's speech, because it is a sign, another sign of moderation in China. They're opening their doors slowly because they're very suspicious of us and they're suspicious of the West in general, what the West did to them years ago. And there's been such an absence of any contact. But they have a defense minister now. That defense minister is a civilian. That indicates to anyone that watches China that the civilians are running the military. They admit that they had a problem with some of the military commanders. And uh, I guess it was about six months ago, there are several top military commanders, generals, 
uh, were shifted from very sensitive areas, downgraded in my mind. These men were close to uh, Lin Piao, the man who was Mao's heir apparent, who was killed in an air crash, the man who turned against Mao. They admit that there are still people like that. I don't think they're in any great number, but they're not taking any chances. These were the men, as the, as the regime puts it itself, who wanted, like Lu Xiaoqi, their former president, who wanted to, they say, follow the capitalist road. They didn't want this. You see, China, when China was capitalist, it served only special interests. It, ser it served, in my mind, those men around Chiang Kai-shek who were unbelievably corrupt, men who came out of, out of that regime when, when they fled to Taiwan and to New York and Chicago and Europe, millionaires, men who, when we would send, because we Americans are good people, and if you recall, uh, during World War II, we sent hundreds of thousands of tons worth of supplies and food to the Chinese people. They never got that food. If they did, they had to pay for it at exorbitant prices. It was supposed to be free food, free rice. It, the money from that food went into the pockets of these people. Now that's what Mao Zedong does not want to see again in China. He wants to see what they're working towards, stability. And everyone is working. Everyone has a job to do in that country. It's just unbelievable. Uh, there's no laziness. There are basically no problems. The only, the only place where I saw trouble in the 15,000 miles I traveled was in the city of Canton. That city is, uh, well, it's Guangdong province. It's in southern China. And the southern Chinese, they're what we really see here in this country. They're Cantonese. And they are more emotional than the northerners. They've had a lot of problems in Canton. They had these wall posters, these character posters, hundreds of them all over downtown Canton. And I saw some public trials. Uh, night and day, truckloads of what they call the People's Militia would drive through the streets. And they had uh, what I referred to as bad boys and bad girls. Uh, they stood in the back of the truck. Their heads were bowed. They had signs around them. Uh, the signs depicting the, the crimes that they had committed. I asked what crimes they had committed. Thievery, they said, yes, we still have a problem, primarily in, in, in Canton, uh, of crime, of thievery. Uh, and also, young people running away. I said, what do you mean running away? Well, those who didn't like manual labor, those who didn't like working next to the peasants would try to run to another city or try to escape, you've probably read about this, to, uh, to Hong Kong where they wind up uh, in crime again. They think that Hong Kong is a wealthy city. They hear stories about this. A Chinese, uh, Hong Kong Chinese told me, who was visiting China while I was there, he said they, they rather annoyed with us. He said they see us dressed better than they are. He said, but uh, at the same time, they don't realize that we have to work, and we have to work very hard in Hong Kong, and there are no jobs in Hong Kong. It's a very small place. So when, if those who manage to flee to the British Crown Colony, uh, they find they can't get jobs and they can't sponge off the government, so they turn to crime. And now the British authorities are sending them back. But no one is severely punished. I had a discussion with one of the uh, leading officials in Canton about crime and about other acts of violence and those who run away. And he said, well, we hold these public trials and the people criticize them. Then they must go back to the farms and the peasants will criticize them. But, he says, anyone can be rehabilitated. If they want to follow the line, there is no real punishment meted out. The death sentence, even for murderers, he told me, he said they try to rehabilitate the person. He said, in some cases they succeed. I said, what happens when you don't succeed? He said, yes, then, they, then the death sentence is imposed. The same applies to uh, narcotics. There is no narcotics problem in China today. There have been reports. Uh, that, uh, and again, this is propaganda from the nationalist side, that the uh, Chinese communists are trying to subvert uh, the Far East and the United States by dumping tons of narcotics into our country and the other countries of Asia. Um, I mentioned this to a Chinese official, and he was absolutely appalled. He said, you know the, about the opium war? I said, yes. He said, we didn't know about opium, narcotics, he said, until the British 
brought that drug, that plant, into China. And they had a terrible problem. And one of Mao's priorities when he took over the government, one of his first priorities, was to eradicate this problem that was pulling China down. And they tried to rehab rehabilitate addicts. They had some success. But they meted out the death sentence to any of those who were caught transporting narcotics, smuggling narcotics, uh, selling narcotics. And this man said to me, this Chinese, he said, do you think, based on how the, the drug, opium, nearly destroyed our country, do you think that we would foist this on any other country? And when I got out, this was my previous trip to China, I happened to meet a friend of mine who's with the US Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. They were having a regional conference in Hong Kong, and they invited me to lunch. And I told them the story. And I said, you gentlemen are in a position to know. I said, do you think China is trying to subvert Asia, the United States, with drugs? And to a man, agents, representative agents from Philippines, Americans, from Tokyo, from Hong Kong, elsewhere, said, absolutely not. We have never had one indication of this. They did find narcotics, get this, a uh, uh, shipment of narcotics that were stamped on these packages of, of uh, heroin, stamped, made in the People's Republic of China. Can you imagine? It was, it was one of these silly plants again, obviously by the nationalists. Uh, uh, they're, they're very silly in, in, the way, in the way they act. The Chinese are not concerned, but they are concerned that people will get the wrong idea. Uh, they are, in my mind, and certainly today, a very, very moral people. You see very few police in China, interestingly enough. None in the countryside. Of course, in Peking, you will see People's Liberation Army men armed on duty, as you see Secret Service men armed on duty around our White House, around there uh, where Mao Zedong and the other Chinese leaders live. But very few policemen, with the exception of traffic policemen. And as I say, out in the countryside, none. Uh, even the old people uh, are utilized, those who have retired. People in China, there's no age of retirement. A person works as long as he, he or she can work. Not so much the woman, but the man. And when they decide that that's it, they retire. There's no mandatory retirement age, 60, 65 or whatever. But to keep the people busy, they have, rather, it's a people's police. The old people uh, will go into the streets and just in effect, patrol the streets. They don't carry a gun. They don't carry a stick. And if they see some mischief, some young people making mischief, they call them over as the adults, because the Chinese still have a great respect, filial piety, it's called, for the adults and the, the, the older people. And we'll talk to them, reason with them. Uh, if a child gets in trouble uh, and they admit that, you know, uh, they have children who are uh, mischievous, uh, then the people in the area that they live. If that's in a village, then it's the villagers. You know, talk to the child, try to reason with the child, and try to work it out. Uh, but there's no physical punishment meted out. English today has replaced Russian. English is the number one language uh, in China today. When I was there two years ago, they started English language lessons on Radio Peking. And Radio Peking basically goes throughout the country. And they put out English language books. And you know, they're teaching English in the grammar schools. This is something that I would like to see here. I'd like to see Chinese. I'd like to see other languages taught in, the, in the, our grammar schools. Because these are when children are in their formative years and can learn more quickly than, than, than we can, can pick up more quickly. Uh, they sell many English language books. They're very popular now. And books on America are popular. When I returned this time, I noticed the young people in the hotels, the waitresses and the young waiters and uh, others, uh, were listening very intently to the English language lessons. And when they found out that I was not, that I not only spoke English, that I was an American, very, very friendly. And where two years ago they were speaking a word or two, now they're speaking in sentences. They're, they work very, very hard. And they're very, very pleased to meet Americans. In Shanghai, you walk down the Bund at night, the harbor, and you'll have young Chinese come up to you. Where are you from in the United States? Tell us about the United States. There is no, I never met in these two trips any animosity from any of uh, the, the people that I came across, worker, student, peasant. Just a genuine show, and you know when it's genuine and when it's not, 
show of friendship. They're not actors. They were not play acting, and they were not set up for me. I could walk around on my own. I could go places on my own. Oh, of course, I don't speak Chinese. I'm trying to learn it now. But I uh, had to go travel with a, with a translator. Just he and I traveled together. A man who didn't try to, this is another expression that I don't buy, brainwash me, because I don't think anybody can be brainwashed. I don't, I don't buy that theory. But, you know, see for yourself, you know, and see our shortcomings, too. So we have a lot to learn from the Chinese, and they have a lot to learn from us. I would like to see us take the step. I would when, or if, uh, the President goes there this year, because, and recognize, fully rec recognize the People's Republic of China and all it means. I think that they, in the long run, will be a stabilizing influence for us in the Far East. I know Asians who believe that, men like Carlos Ramelo, the Foreign Minister of the Philippines, he's always believed that. It's a, it's, people say, well, how can you let down your friends like Chiang Kai-shek? Well, we've, we haven't, ladies and gentlemen, been politically expedient in the past. We have in ways that shock us, ways that we're only learning about now, but we haven't in practical ways. I think if we had recognized China a number of years ago, that possibly we could have avoided this horrible catastrophe that caused the call, that uh, cost $365 billion. This is the figure, this is the figure that Mansfield just learned before he went to China. $365 billion plus all of the lives and all of those young men who are cluttering the veterans' hospitals who will never walk again, never speak again. I think we could have avoided it. The things that we were not told about China or the things that we were told that were lies and propaganda. For example, it came out year before last at the Senate hearings, the congressional hearings on China, that shortly after the takeover by Mao Zedong and his party, that he and Zhou Enlai sent a very private communication to the then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, saying that they would like America's help, that they had respect for the American people. They've always said this, incidentally. To this day, the Chinese have always said they like and have respect for the American people. And they would like to come to Washington. This was brought out by a former State Department official who is now a professor of political science of Chinese affairs. And uh, this communication was never answered, was never answered. This was before the Chinese really turned to the Soviets, it was never answered at all. Why? We don't know to this day. It was rejected out of hand. Maybe things would have been different again if we had have accepted Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai. You know that right after World War II in that regard, uh, our OSS fought and helped uh, Ho Chi Minh. These men described Ho Chi Minh to our government as a nationalist more than a communist. And you know, I believe Mao is a nationalist. And his brand of communism is not Marxism, Leninism, though they, they harp on this for ideological effect, but it's Chinese. Country really hasn't changed. It's Chinese. It's the Chinese mentality that's being, that's, that's applying these, the, this ideology. It's not the same as the, uh, as the Soviet brand, nor is it the same as the Romanian brand, which is different from the Soviet brand. In other words, what I'm saying, there is no more communist menace if there ever was one. There is no international communist conspiracy. Again, something that, you know, we've, we seem to have to have a bugaboo. So in China, it's the Chinese brand of communism. These OSS officers reported back good things about uh, Ho Chi Minh, the late Ho Chi Minh. And Ho Chi Minh asked, he asked also for our help. And again, no, people in Washington said no, because he was a communist. And I wonder again if we had helped Ho Chi Minh, uh, if uh, the situation wouldn't have been different, if we could have saved all those lives and all that money that is uh, certainly affecting our economy today. Now, I think we really have to look inward, and we have to be realists. We have to be pragmatic. Uh, it's not a question, in my mind, of friendship. It's a question of political reality and expediency if we want to keep the peace. 
Taiwan is an affair that must be settled by the Chinese themselves. And this is something else, I believe, that Chiang Kai-shek believes. It must be settled by the Chinese themselves. We have no right to interfere. Why should we have troops, while we've pulled out some, why should we have American forces on Taiwan? This worries the Chinese communists. Uh, this official said, I said, well, we have pulled out some of our forces. He said, that is a good gesture. And I said, we pulled out our Seventh Fleet. He said, that's a good gesture, too, on the part of your government. But he said, why do you still have troops there? And I said, that's a good question. I don't know. Why? He said, again, this is not in the spirit of the Shanghai communique. So I think that if President Ford goes, he must go with a real gesture. And I personally would like that real gesture to be formal recognition of the People's Republic of China. It does not have to be at the expense of our relations with Taiwan, certainly our trade relations. Those can go on. I mentioned to you that the Japanese still have excellent trade relations with Taiwan. But uh, we, have to, we have to be realists. We talk about uh, foreign systems and, uh, the, and communism. It seems the countries that we do back, for example, like South Korea, that's a dictatorship. It's a different kind. It's a fascistic dictatorship. So is the regime in South Vietnam that we now want to give more money to, that pour it into their own pockets, not into the people's pockets. So is the, in effect, our closest, in my mind, our closest ally, uh, the Philippines, the Philippines. There's still martial law there. Marcos hasn't canceled that. Why is there martial law? Thailand, well, it took the students to overthrow that dictatorship, that military dictatorship. Why do we back those countries, you see? What do we ever get from those countries? Nothing. It's what they get from us. This is why they sent token forces to Vietnam because Johnson at the Manila Summit Conference begged them to. The Filipinos didn't want to send their people to die in that war. They're Asians. They knew that that war would, n would never end, just end in needless loss of life. So I think if we're going to improve our situation, if we are going to have a generation of peace, which is what Nixon talked about, and I like that. And I think one of the finest things that President Nixon did was to go. Here was a man who was a really staunch anti-communist, but saw the reality of the situation, and went to the People's Republic and offered the olive branch. And things were starting to change. I think we, again, can learn from one another. I think that we can live in peace. We don't have to accept their system. They should, don't have to accept our system. But what we do have to accept in this world today are systems that will work for peace. And I believe sincerely that China will work for peace. It does not want war. It has too much to do. It'll be a hundred years, if that, if, if not longer, before they even have a semblance, become a semblance, semblance of an industrialized nation. Zhou Enlai said and says repeatedly, we do not want to be a superpower. Yes, we know we want to be influential. We know that we've got 800 million people. They are working on nuclear, uh, nuclear weapon system because, like, they don't trust either. They're afraid of the Soviets, more afraid of the Soviets than they are of us. But he wants peace and he wants stability. The only way China is going to build is by having peace and stability, having a detente, not just with the United States, with the world. This is what these men want, and I believe that the leadership in China that will come up after Mao and Zhou go, I know a lot of young officials, they're very much like us. They want closer relations with the United States. They want to be friends. And believe me, the Chinese will never, like some of our other allies, as my colleagues and I call them, my, my journalistic colleagues, that we, it's being a little bitter, the Chinese will never be uh, the best friends that money can buy. And that's what we've had in the past. They will not ask us for anything. They will ask for our help and our advice, but they won't ask for credits and loans. Believe me, they won't. They're a very, very proud people. And I'll entertain questions now. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any, sir? Yes. How about the average working person? What does he know of or what does he think of? 
they, uh, this is, again, there is, and uh, there's certainly ignorance on both sides. And I'll give you a little anecdote in that respect. Uh, when I traveled there uh, two years ago, I had my wife and my two daughters, and um, uh, we traveled with this young lady who was uh, educated at the University of Peking, and Su Man Lee, uh, toward the end of the trip, sort of looked at me and she said, you know, she said, uh, They are, but all through this, uh, when I interviewed Zhou Enlai in 1955 at Bandung, he said then, he says now, we have always been friendly with the American people. The American people have been good to us. The American people have never tried to hurt us. But they always add, it's the imperialists in your government, those who want war. Those are the Americans that we are against. But we believe, and he's always maintained this in 55, that the American people, and I'm told that Mao feels the same way. The American people are a good people who do want peace and who want to live in friendship. But you see, when they, when they refer to the imperialists, I, I, I can't disagree with them in the sense that I, I've been to Vietnam and I've been out in combat. I didn't sit on my duff in Saigon. And I've seen what we have done. Now we say we're going in there to protect democracy and freedom or to instill democracy and freedom in Vietnam. And they listen to that. And then they see that we use napalm, we, we, we devastate the country with defoli uh, defoliation, wipe out beautifully rich land that will be wiped out for several years because of these chemicals we've spread. They, they uh, see the, uh, they hear about the tiger cages that the South Vietnamese maintained where they stuffed uh, lime down the nostrils and the throats of political dissidents, not communists, but people who happen to disagree with the Chu regime. This is what they hear about us. But now, as I say, this time even more, we're more books on the United States, more, uh, uh, more pamphlets in schools, and they're being taught, again from the grammar school level, uh, uh, about uh, the United States as well as uh, other foreign countries. Sir? <coughs> No, there is, a, uh, there is a Catholic church, some Chinese, the older Chinese go to in, uh, in Peking, in Xi'an, which is their great and most historical city, their great cultural center, a fantastic city. They have uh, a, uh, a Muslim, uh, a mosque, and I asked whether uh, uh, people went there, and they said yes, those who want to go. They discourage religion, officially, they discourage relig religion, among the young people, the old people who want to go still go. Uh, we went into one shrine. It was really rather a museum, and I thought it was rather interesting. This was again in Xi'an. I saw uh, joss sticks being burned and fruit offerings, and I said, oh, this is rather religious, isn't it? It has something to do with Buddhism, and they said, yes, it is. They said, if the old people want to come here and do this, uh, they do it. But, sir, yes, uh, religion is uh, officially discouraged or it's certainly not uh, discouraged and it's not encouraged. Oh, but in incidentally, this time, uh, in central China, I saw a very interesting thing. I tried to get a picture of it and I couldn't. They had a religious funeral ceremony. Oh boy, the, they were all in white and we were in a car and uh, they were crying. They're very emotional uh, when it comes to, to any death and uh, beating the drums and such. And I said, I thought this, and, the, and uh, they were burying this person, whoever it was. And I said, uh, I thought uh, the official policy was cremation. And they said, well, it is, but if they want to bury their dead in the traditional way, uh, they, they can do that. And then in the same area, I saw grave mound after grave mound. They do it in mounds. They bury them, but then they, they cover, they have a mound of earth. And there were just uh, hundreds of grave mounds. Uh, the reason they say that they, incidentally, that uh, they, uh, uh, the word is cremation, because 
There, in the past, they claimed, too much land was wasted burying people, and they need that land now for crops in order to feed. You know, I said 800 million mouths. Sir? That's the thorn in their side. Uh, the Portuguese, th this matter incidentally is under discussion now, you know, with the new regime in Portugal. I think Portugal, uh, uh, Portugal has been trying to get these various monkeys off their back, uh, their backs. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, a Portuguese official, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, shortly before I left Hong Kong, I read, was going to hold discussions with the Chinese on this matter. I don't know whether he was going to Peking or they would be held in Macau. But uh, that is certainly a problem, the drug trafficking there, as well as the drug trafficking in Hong Kong, which is even more serious. And uh, uh, when I left Hong Kong, they were just going through a tremendous anti-corruption campaign. Anyone else? Uh, this gentleman? Yes, then I'll get It was true to a certain extent, but our facts show at the Department of Defense that the majority of arms that North Vietnam received during the height of the war came from the Soviet Union, not from the Chinese. And uh, two other things that might interest you. The uh, Chinese, when we had convinced them that we wanted to get out of Vietnam, put pressure, which they can do very easily, or influence on the North Vietnamese. Uh, but you see, this is, uh, this is a bone of contention. The Soviet Union would like to get, for political purposes, like to get North Vietnam on its side. North Vietnamese are walking a very tight line here. But the Russians did, uh, uh, sorry, the, the Chinese did reduce their military supplies even more. Most of the, the catches of weapons when I was in Vietnam that we found to also substantiate what the Department of Defense says were, uh, were uh, Russian. Russian made. The Chinese, yes, did supply them with a lot of foodstuffs, medical supplies, and other things, but uh, not as many arms as the, the Russians. Look, the Russians supplied them with these, uh, these Nike uh, uh, missiles and uh, the MiG fighters, the jet fighters. But also, it may interest you to know, I'm told on good authority, and again, uh, uh, mentioning Taiwan, which is the thorn in Peking's side. Taiwan is it. There's no question. We can have those relations. We can have American news bureaus over there when uh, we fully recognize Peking. But I'm told that when President Nixon visited Peking and, and uh, agreed to that historic communique, the Shanghai communique, he was told in no unequivocal terms by Mao, who, whom he met, and by Cho, that they would never take Taiwan by force. And I find that the Chinese are honorable people. They keep their word. They honestly keep their word. If I had, having had experience on both sides of that communist fence, uh, Moscow and Peking, if I had to do it, I wouldn't like to do it, but if I had to trust anyone more and felt that, anyone, that we could become closer to in the long run, I would trust the Chinese any day over the Soviets. Uh, this gentleman back here had a question, I think. Some, somebody back there have a question? I'm oh, sorry. Very, very close, because this is still their main priority. This is their main priority. I was saying this fantastic transformation of land that's taking place. They've had some good harvests. They're very proud to say that uh, there's enough, certainly enough food for everyone. Everyone is well fed. Nobody's starving, as in the old days. Enough, everyone has clothes on their backs. They're not like ours, but uh, they're not rags. And everyone has shoes on their feet. Uh, to I, it's hard to say with total self-sufficiency self self because of 800 million people that they have to feed every day. But in all of the places I went, they showed me, they, they were proud to say that they could not only supply the state with not only its quota of grain requested, or rice or millet, but uh, even more, they overfulfilled their quota and still had reserves for their commune or their area, their village. And every peasant has his own personal reserves of grain, of millet, and of wheat. 
So there, there didn't seem to be the great problem there. They're, uh, what they're pushing now, uh, uh, chemical fertilizer plants, they need those very badly. Now that's one of their priorities, but you, of course that's linked with agriculture. But uh, they're reasonably self-sufficient in food. There is certainly enough to eat for everyone. This, uh, and not too many years ago, 26, 27 years ago, people were starving in the streets. That's gone. That is absolutely gone. People had to sell uh, their children, their daughters, the peasants did, into prostitution in order to get enough money to get a handful of rice. No, they're, in that sense, they're more than self-sufficient, sir. Uh, lady, please. All right, this one then. then uh, no. And they're not feeling inflation. It's a country of bicycles. Uh, the, the, the few cars that you see on the, the very wide streets, not just in Peking, but Xi'an and Canton, are official cars, trucks. People, you, in the morning, you wake up wherever you are, wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning. <coughs> when they go off to work, <coughs> to the, to the, it's almost like a, it's not, a, I was going to say a tingle, it is a tingle, but there are so many, thousands and thousands of bicycles, and it sounds like a bell, and they're going down the streets. Bicycles, so they're a long way from a pollution problem, although they are concerned with some of the factories in the industrial areas that uh, spew out uh, just heavy clouds of black smoke. Uh, they've taken steps to correct that, and now any new factory that goes up must uh, conform to certain pollution standards. So they're going to try to, well, it's the, believe me, there's no question of pollution there. Uh, uh, their oil reserves, this is something very interesting, uh, are vast. We don't know, they don't even know how vast they are. They've been selling oil, they've started to sell oil to Japan. <coughs> Excuse me, I believe to the Philippines, and I think that they just uh, concluded an ag agreement with Thailand. Um, they have offshore oil. What they don't have is the technology nor the drilling equipment. But a friend of mine who represents, uh, we have the best oil drilling equipment in the world, to my mind, and a friend of mine who's a lawyer uh, in Washington uh, just came back from China and just sold them over a million dollars, not much, but it's something for the Chinese, in oil drilling equipment. Uh, as I say, we don't know how much uh, oil they have. Uh, but no, there's no energy crisis. There is no inflation. Uh, prices are the same. Prices remain stable. Food is cheap. And uh, so are the basic commodities of life. And that's all they're interested in because they've never had these commodities before. These things are still within the price of everyone. Food and clothing, etc. cetera, the, ba the basic commodities. Uh, somebody, well, uh, yes? I'm sorry, what? Their health care is, <coughs> is not entirely free. <coughs> it's uh, the peasant must pay one yuan, 30 odd cents, a month for medicines, all health care. <coughs> the worker, for the worker, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely free. It's, it's, it's strange. And it's basically good health care. I went to a hospital in, in uh, Huhout, Inder Mongolia. Uh, where they had an atomic reactor to treat cancer from Canada. It was one of the most modern hospitals I've ever seen. It was a beautiful hospital. Um, how would it work in this country? <clears throat> Something's got to work in this country because I think the American people are getting fed up paying the, the exorbitant bills uh, that we pay, not just for doctors, but for hospitalization that our, that our medical insurance doesn't even cover. Uh, I would certainly, my God, like to, I pay enough into tax and Social Security, I don't know where, I, I'll never see that Social Security, but I'd like to see some of that money diverted to some kind of, of, uh, of uh, uh, medical insurance that the government can offer, as their government does, that will ease our burden. But uh, Washington doesn't seem to be interested in this. Uh, sorry, what? Yes. <clears throat> they have what they call the May 7th Kader or Cadre schools all over China. And these are schools where men who have committed errors, committed crimes, <coughs> excuse me, are sent 
for indefinite periods, and I say indefinite periods until their ways are corrected, where they study Mao Zedong's thought from the Little Red Book, <coughs> where they have to confess their errors, and then they go out and they work in the fields. There, I've been to one. <coughs> it's um, one of the big ones outside of Peking. Um, there's no barbed wire around. There are no guns. There's no place to run in the first place. <coughs> And they stay there, and if they say, yes, we've been rehabilitated, they go back. They're given their job back. There have been several high officials who have come back who have been rehabilitated, one of whom <coughs> is now number three man in China, Deng Xiaoping, and who has just made the, uh, the defense minister, Chinese de defense minister, and there have been several others. Now, this goes for young and old uh, pol politi politicians, workers, Anyone who can correct the error of his ways, he stays there as long as necessary. Their word is that Lu Xiaoqi, the former president, is still on one. Now, there's a story that came out that Lu Xiaoqi, this came out of Hong Kong, died a physical death. He's died a political death. But they've said to me, he, but he is still alive. I was told this. Uh, why the story came out, I don't know. And it came from a Chinese communist source. But even, I think, even a man like Lu Xiaoqi, <coughs> who they felt was an enemy of the state. He, 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 was, he was the one that they accused of following the capitalist road, uh, that he could be rehabilitated. I do believe them that everyone is given that chance. Some don't want the chance, and they stay at the May 7th schools. That's it. Not, a uh, gentleman asked, do they distinguish in China <coughs> between civil and criminal acts, not, not, not to the best of my knowledge. Uh, they, uh, they may, they, there is basically, as I got it, I asked to go see a court, and my, my very good friend, uh, Jerome Cohen, who's a professor at law at Harvard University and, and a, a scholar of, uh, in Chinese law, Jerry's been over there several times. He's asked to see a court of law, and they, they, they don't, they, they, <clears throat> they, they don't say there aren't any. They just say, well, no, not this time. I don't think there are. I, it's my guess, and I think Jerry's too, that the, the people are the political system. As I explained before, the, the people decide on the nature of the crime and how the person should be punished. Uh, the young people, for example, who try to run away are sent back, and they're, they're, oh, one, of the, uh, one of the ways they uh, punish them is ostracism. Yeah. They go back to the, to the uh, commune that they left, to the farm that they left, and nobody talks to them. And they're given very hard labor, physical labor, but nobody speaks to them. Um, but as I did tell you, I was told for the first time, yes, there, there is the death.